Um, the why and what are a broader definition of success. Um, I feel a little bit bad, bad about um, my presentation in this regard, where this is uh, titled a celebration. Um, and so I'd like to help you celebrate, and I hope to have structured this presentation to help you celebrate uh, as you uh, uh, wanted to do in this uh, event. Um, but I'm also wanting to push you towards a broader definition of success, not resting where you are now, but moving forward. So I'll be talking about defining uh, a broader definition of success in the context of, thank you, uh, in the context of um, your conference themes, which are access, retention, and assessment. And then we'll have a question and answer period um, at the end. Okay, here are the objectives. Um, I like to make it clear when I'm a presenter that I have my own objectives. I don't like to pretend that it's all about you. It's a little bit about me too. What I'm hoping to do is to interact with you um, during the presentation and afterwards, clarify my thinking and learn something new um, about what is a broader definition of success. I'm still um, working on trying to figure out what that means for me and for others. For you, I have three things. I hope that you, at the end of this presentation, you will be able to describe at least three ways um, to broaden how we define success in higher education. And I have two action items for you. The first one is to identify at least one strategy that you will try to use to enact a broader definition of success. And this is sort of a little homework assignment. As you go through the conference um, and look at the different presentations on the best practices, um, I'd like you to identify at least two practices or strategies to celebrate how they offer a broader definition of success. I think I'm gonna talk about in a moment about, if I'm talking about what's broader, I have to define what's not broader. Um, and so I've, I've seen and looking at at least the descriptions of the uh, presentations that will be here, I see uh, several examples at least of presentations that are already working towards a broader definition of success. Um, I'm using several resources uh, for this uh, presentation. First one is um, my book that was mentioned already, uh, Seven Futures of American Education. Um, Another one that I'll be referring to is a paper I wrote this past year uh, that's in a, a, a journal called eMentor, uh, which is called A Better Completion Agenda, Expanding the Range of Acceptable Outcomes in Higher Education. I'll also be referring to some of the resources that I used to write that article. Um, I will also refer to a, a paper that I'm writing in press uh, that will be published probably this month or next month on transfer pathways in cybersecurity education, which is one of the areas I do a lot of work in these days. And then in doing some research for this presentation to prepare, I found this interesting paper uh, by the authors Nora and Chris from 2012, which I'll be referring to. I assume that at some point that these slides will be made available to you if you want to, so you can uh, access the links by that, um, uh, by that means. Okay, so why broader? There are two main reasons. Um, and I would say they are these, need and opportunity. When I wrote my book, The Seven Futures of American Education, it's mostly focused on what's going to happen next with online education. I've been in online education now for over 20 years, and I would say that we are in a second era of online education. The first era of online education was defined by providing access, um, that is, the, the proverbial um, single mom in her, in her pajamas, sitting at the computer at night, working on a computer, uh, doing coursework, um, but making access greater uh, for all. And my book argues that the second era of online education can be defined by a focus on improving quality, using online and other digital technologies to improve quality, not just for online education, but for all education. What makes this possible? I found that there are two converging trends that make this possible. The first one is what I call cyber symbiosis, which is society and education have become irretrievably interdependent on digital and uh, online and other digital technologies. The second one is what I call education power. Education has a newfound cultural importance. Um, it's no longer good enough uh, just to 
work, you sort of muddle your way through high school and then go get a job at the local factory. Most of those jobs are gone. Um, as Tony Car Carvalho at uh, Georgetown University noted, education, higher education, has become almost the only remaining path to a middle class life in American society. Um, but fortunately, we are recognizing the power of education and, and the need for us to make it better. So these two together are a spectacular opportunity. Um, and my son made this graphic for me. You notice, um, uh, I, I coined the term cyber symbiosis and I thought I was so proud of myself. So I thought, one day I thought, in cloud we trust. That's very clever. And I went to Google to search and see if anybody else had thought of it. And there were 600 results. <laughs> it wasn't quite so clever with that one. Anyways, that's where we are. That's why broader. Okay, now what's not broader? This is another picture. Um, I don't have a picture of the uh, outside, but this is how I feel about um, how the, the picture looks um, sometimes. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about is, is uh, what is what we call the completion agenda. There are two main parts to the completion agenda when you look at it closely. One is a desire among policymakers and some other people to make the United States number one again in the number of graduates, the percentage of graduates that we uh, produce, uh, college graduates. And the other one is this notion that everyone should go to college. Now, there are a couple of problems, there are a couple of good things about this, but one of the things that I found about the completion agenda is that I wanted to, I was looking for research of other countries, how are they handling this? And what I found is that, at least as far as I could find, the United, this, this um, um, perspective is unique to the United States. The European countries, Asian countries, no other countries are trying uh, to do a completion agenda in this sense. Some of them are trying to, uh, for example, do it through a vocational program or apprenticeship program. Um, or software changes programs, which are required for this computer. Um, so there are some pluses to this. Uh, Performance-based funding is an example, and I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. Competency-based education is another example, and I'll talk about an example of that in a moment. It's an aspirational goal, and it targets the right people. Um, it targets the students that haven't been paid attention to in the past. But there are a lot of minuses to this. In my opinion, as I wrote in the paper, I think that the idea of being number one is an empty goal. Um, and when you look at it closely, we have, we have better things to do than try to simply churn out a higher proportion of graduates than say Switzerland or South Korea. Um, there are more important things that we need to do. It's also an unattainable goal. It's actually, if you look at it closely, it's a form of triage. And I will talk about that in more detail later. Um, and it encourages problems like uh, uh, encouraging quantity over quality uh, among some of the other problems. So that's why not. Also, what's not broader are the legacy systems. So you've probably been to a presentation, and I won't show you slides, but I'll do it briefly, where somebody tells you about the percentage of students out of 100 students uh, in high school this many go to college, and this many finish the first year, and this many get their degree, and you go from 100 to 80 to 40 to 12. I was listening to one of these presentations one time some years ago, and my colleague Gary Miller, who's now retired, who was the executive director of Penn State University World Campus, was listening beside me. And when he heard this, he turned to me and he said, that is exactly what the system was designed to produce. And he's right. The existing legacy system is designed to produce a certain number of graduates. You may remember, I'm old enough, a few of you might be old enough to remember the story about when you're in the audience, you're, in, you're sitting at your first year university um, class and your professor looks at you and says, look to your left, look to your right, one of you will be gone next semester. That was the, Universities used to be set up for sorting and screening, and there are a lot of other legacy attitudes and expectations that get in the way of a broader definition of success. But it really has changed. The, the whole way we look at education has changed, and I will talk about that in a moment as well. So what is truly broader? I'm going to talk about four principles. The first
first one is personalization. This one is important, so I'm going to talk about this a little more now, right now. Because personalization is um, a word that's being used more and more. And in my experience, it's being used too narrowly also. For example, some people will say big data is personalization because you can use big data to identify more about individual students and what they need. Yes, but why isn't anybody talking about big personalization? I have not heard that phrase yet. I hear big data every day, but I don't hear big personalization. I also like to look at this, sometimes I like to go way back in the, in the past, and I think of um, um, the book Megatrends. Anybody remember that book from the 1980s? High tech, high touch. High touch is, is, is a, a personalization. So it's not just also um, creating, for example, customized inputs where, okay, well you get to do this, you get to do that. But it's also creating personalized outcomes, recognizing, as we really already know deep down, that our students really do all learn different things. We treat them as if they're all, we're trying to get them all to learn the same things, but they also learn different things and they learn them in different ways. The second one is transparency, and I'll talk more about that in context. Um, agency by which I mean the learner having control, whether it's active learning, um, whether it's uh, the learner, the locus of control with the learner, that sort of thing. But the learner having more control over the process. And finally, continuous improvement. Okay. <coughs> Defining successful access more broadly. I want to tell a story about a, a student that I met recently. A friend of mine said, I have this student that works with me. Uh, he, my friend uh, uh, owns a lot of apartment buildings. I live in the Washington, <laughs> D.C. area. Um, he owns a lot of apartment buildings, and this person helps him fix up things. He said, um, this student, this friend of mine, he's trying to figure out what to do with, with um, uh, his academic studies. You're an expert in online education. Can you talk to him? So we all went out to lunch, and I learned his story, which was this. Um, he had gone to the University of Maryland College Park, and he had done very well in his um, uh, 